<laughs> we will talk about practical aspects and talk about functionals. And um, if I just would attempt to make write down on the blackboard the list of available functionals you can choose from for calculation, I would probably be still writing on Monday morning or the <coughs> next or thing. There, there, are, there are hundreds, thousands, there's an incredible amount of uh, functions available to choose from. However, there are only very few ones which are really popular. Many functions are for very special uses or have been developed to prove something. But still, there are many. And in order to kind of to make a system, um, some, some systematic classification of these functions, there are different ways. One way how one could classify the various functions you have available to kind of to see a bit the light or the order in it might be how they have been developed. So we have so far seen only local density for approximation, and I told you this comes from a homogeneous electron gas, and it is made such that if your electron density was everywhere constant, it would be exact. And then we have said, even though we apply it to systems where the density is not constant at all, it works extremely well. And I mentioned, without giving explanations, that it works so well because this way of approximating satisfies some exact rules one knows about the exact unknown exact function. So uh, the unknown exact function, we do not know it, obviously, but we know some properties it must have. And local density approximation satisfies many of those. Okay? And if we now try to, to find a systematic order in the different functions, one way of looking at it is how they have been developed. What, where does it come from? And there we could separate them into two main classes. One class is functionals which are developed such that they satisfy as many exact properties of the exact functional as possible. Okay? So some of them are already satisfied by LDA. But then people introduce more complicated functional forms and try to fit parameters in them or the, the function form such that more and more exact conditions of the exact function are satisfied. This is a way where you close your eyes, you have never any chemical intuition, you close your eyes in front of the real system you would like to treat and you develop your function with the goal of satisfying some abstract but exact conditions. This is one way one can go forward. And this way of going forward is associated with one scientist mainly. I mean, there are many scientists who have done this, but there is one name which comes up, and this is John Perdue. So John Perdue is a scientist um, um, who has, kind of from the first days of density functional theory, dedicated his scientific career to developing functions. And he is the one who has established this writing down exact conditions and trying to satisfy them with more and more functions. And even, even last year he came out with an important new function. So, and uh, since these things are so much used, these functions, per John Perdue is today the most cited scientist of all times. So he is really, I mean, <laughs> because everyone who uses functions cites the papers where he's done, so the number of citations of this guy is more than, than Isaac Newton, Albert Einstein, <laughs> and whoever. And he recently changed university. I think he went, uh, I'm not sure if it was Temple, but he changed university and he went, I think, to Temple University in the US. And the new university where John Perdue ended up became just by this one hiring the most cited university in the world. <laughs> so it is really... Um, okay, so, I mean, if you want a lot of citations, develop a good functional and you will get a lot of citations. So this is one class of the kind of the Purdue class of function and in their abbreviations in their name that typically appears a P. Like L LDAs, all these functions, you will see it in a minute, have some abbreviations. And if there's a P in it, it typically means that Purdue was one of the developers, and this is one class. Then there's another class of things where people said, why should we look at these exact conditions? No, we already know that we want to use it in materials, in atoms, in, uh, in molecules, in crystals, so in, in, in real things. So the second class of things are people who write down functionals with a lot of parameters, and then they fit those parameters such that it, um, the results are very close to the results for molecules or for uh, uh, so they make a table of important molecules, important kind of bonds, important materials, and so on. They calculate them with a non-density functional theory method, for example, with the wave function method. They know what they want as a result, and then they fit the density function such that it is best for getting those results. 
And if they are test systems on which they fit, is really representative of the chemical world or the chemical space, then this means that very likely these functions will also work in other unknown situations. Okay? So these are two kinds of classes, those which are fitted to data sets and those which close their eyes in front of chemistry and uh, try only to fit abstract mathematical exact rules. I think one can say that the most used ones are those of the first class, the Purdue ones, those which do not rely on any fitting to, to data or molecules, because necessarily, I mean, your tables, your, your things to which you fit is always incomplete. Okay? And uh, the question is how much transferable a function is which has been fitted to one class of materials, how much this is transferred to a new class of materials is not clear. But if you have this other approach, the Purdue approach, the nice thing is that since you have closed your eyes, you, it's not something which is fitted only for transition metals or only for organic matter or only for this or that. It is completely abstract and mathematical and therefore it is typically very nicely transferable. So this is one way how you can classify approaches to, fun to functional approximation. One is according to the way how it is done. And the other, which is recently becoming very popular to characterize functions, is which ingredients are there. And this is what we will try to, to do now. So um, we have origin LDA, and we will start from LDA and then systematically include more things. And I will show you how this systematization works. Okay? So we have already seen examples. The easiest one is always LDA. And I uh, recall that the ex exchange correlation energy, which is a function of n, is approximated to its LDA by an integral of all space, n of r times some local exchange correlation energy density, which is a fun not a functional, but a function of n at that point in space. Okay? So this is local. in the sense that this epsilon function here is using only information at one given point in space. Okay? And then you sum over all points you have in your space, but for each point you take only local information, things you have at that point. Okay? Um, there are many ways how this can be parametrized, and uh, there are typically concrete names, and the most um, used or the most famous LDA is called PC. This is Purdue Zunge. Okay? And again P you see Purdue. John Purdue was here, was also here. So this is one example of, of an, an LDA function is the Purdue Zunge functional. There are other ones which are also quite well known. I will well I could give you later some more things. Um, one is also called W, we are always going wrong, N, doesn't matter. So these are other people who have also fitted this epsilon function to homogeneous electron cast data. They have slightly different functional forms, but in principle, so LDA functionals are per summa or, or other things like that. Okay? So these functionals here, they have all this shape. They work rather well, and I have told you that it's the success of LDA, which probably is historically founded the success of density function theory. But then, since there are clear shortcomings, for example, bonds are always a little bit too, too, too short, um, um, gaps tend to be always to be too weak, and so on. So there, there are well-known shortcomings which are systematically in these kind of functions. So people try to get something better. And then, so, Kind of, this is level number one. And now people started in a systematic way to try to make it better. And then, so the next step was they went to level number two, which is known as a GGA level. GGA means generalized. Ah, sorry. So I have already mentioned LDA if it's non magnetic and LSD, local spin density, if it's magnetic. Hmm? So LSD, again, it's not some, some drugs or something. It's in, for physics people, it is local spin density. Um, 
So GGA is generalized gradient approximation. What is different in GGA? So here you would approximate exchange correlation if it's a GGA. In principle in the same thing, so an integral over all space, n of r, some epsilon exchange correlation, but then in this epsilon here, you now allow not only the local density, but also the gradient of the density. And This is why it's called a gradient approximation. Because in epsilon, in the exchange correlation, energy density appears the gradient of the density. But again, it's a local approximation. Why is it local? Because for each point in space, you obtain something and you use only local, local data, only the density at that point and the norm of the gradient of the density at that very point. Okay? So it is still local. But people call this not a local function, but they call this a semi-local. So it is a little bit less local in a sense, because you see, if you have a function n of r, which varies in space, if at one point you have only the value of the density at that point, then you are truly local. If you have all the information about the gradient of the density. It means you have information about how the density changes close to that point. Therefore, you are looking a little bit, a little bit out of this, this point here. This is why it's, it's still local, but, but you go a little bit further than local, and this is why it's called semi-local. Okay? Now today, clearly the most used functionals, if you may, probably 80% of all DFT calculations use GGAs. And famous, there are two famous names of functions which everyone should remember. They're easy to remember. The most famous one is PBE. This is clearly by far the most important GGA functional. And functions typically, so they have these strange abbreviations, which are always the names of inventors. Okay? So here, PBE, again, John Perdue, it's Perdue, Becke, and, uh, Perdue Burke, and Ernsthoff. Okay? So these are three names. And um, some people say PBE does not mean Perdue Berg and so No, PBE means probably the best exchange correlation. Okay, so <laughs> whatever, it is clearly not the best because there are other, but it is, I would say it is still today the best compromise between quality of the result and computational effort. Because the next classes, which I will write down, become clearly slower in evaluation. Okay. So, probably best exchange correlation is one of them. The other is called blip. Okay. Also here there's a p, but this guy is, is not a Purdue function. <laughs> it's someone else, I don't know who it is. Here the important name is the b, it's Becke. Becke is another guy who has developed a lot of functional, and many people are using blip. So if someone of you should be working with people of our organized matter section, it's very likely that you will be using PBE or blip. PBE you will probably be using if you work with uh, Seriani or myself. Blip you will be using if you work with Ali Azanali because he uh, is working a lot on water. In a water resistance, Blip is known to give very good results. So, <laughs> so, but I mean, you can also use water PBE or whatever. So, but by, it's also a little bit who prefers which function it depends also a little bit on personal tastes and so on. Okay, so Perdit Sunga. Um, VWN are typical LDAs, then you do something better. And as a user, since we are talking about applications, as a user you do not really even notice the difference in computer time. So if something takes you, I don't know, one hour to compute a calculation with an LDA, it will also take you about one hour, perhaps one hour and a minute or so, but more or less the same time to use a GGA. So this is why everyone typically today uses GGAs, which are better. And the question is, you see, sir, now you have more information. You have density and gradient. So since you have more information, you have more liberty to choose how this function looks as a function of more information. 
okay? And the purdue was able, in fact, to satisfy more exact conditions for the functional than you could if you have only one ingredient, just only the density. Okay? So this is why this is becoming, uh, was then kind of more successful. And as I say, so GGAs are the best ones. Okay? Then one can even go further and have something which are known as meta GGAs. What is different in a meta GGA? And they are clearly now much less used, but they might become used a lot because last year or two years ago, Purdue suggested a new meta GGA, which right now looks very promising. So it might be that this becomes very much used. And uh, so they are, they are here the exchange correlation of n is not really in this case a function only of n because it is approximated in a meta function in the following way. Again, integral, this remains always the same. But now we have this density here will be allowed to depend as before on n on the gradient of n at that point but also on tau r. Now what is tau of r? Any idea? The tau is the Greek letter for t. What has been t in our time? So no, no time. <laughs> No time here. Yeah. <laughs> what has been t in our lesson so far? Not the lowercase t, the uppercase t. Kinetic energy. Kinetic energy. So t of r is the kinetic energy density. It is defined, so tau of r is simply defined as the sum over all quantum orbitals of minus h bar square divided by 2m M psi i complex conjugate gradient square psi i. Okay. So if you integrate tau of r over all space, you get the, the Kohn-Sharm kinetic energy. Kohn-Sharm kinetic energy is precisely this here integrated over all space. But you can define it at every point in space and you obtain this. Now, on one hand, adding again, like before, adding one variable more allow, ha, allows you to have a more general form of the function. You can satisfy again even more exact conditions, and the functional, in fact, is becoming better. The other thing is, it is still, in a sense, local, because again, you use only information at that given point the density, the norm of the gradient of, that, of the density at that point. And then something which is also purely local, it's the kinetic energy. But here you see, in fact, we have information now not only about the density, but also about the Kohn-Sharm orbitals. So one might argue that one is kind of leaving here the real world of bona fide density functional theory. Because in density functional theory, if you had a good function, you would not need Kohn-Sharm orbitals. But the kinetic energy density you can define it only if you have those orbitals. But I mean, since everyone is doing Kohn-Sharm, we have those orbitals anyway, and it doesn't cost you to calculate also this. But uh, a, a purist in DFT would say this is not really a density functional, because just knowing the density, you cannot evaluate tau. You need to have the Kohn-Sharm orbitals. Okay? But I mean, uh, this allows that. And uh, so, um, so these meta GGAs, they have some names which are. Um, um, what is it? TPSS, I think, is one of the famous um, functions you can use. You, the other day, you wanted to use a, a TPSS, I think. No, was it? You asked me the other day about using a, a meta GTA. Yes. yes. <laughs> okay. Does it work well? Uh, I didn't try. I didn't try. Okay. <laughs> you can try. Okay. So you see, so there is clearly a hierarchy of approximations. I mean, in each of these worlds, I just give you the most important here, just put you zoom here, PBE or VD. But there are many, many, many more. I mean, there are hundreds of possible GGAs. There are, I would say, tens of meta GGAs. 
But I mean, the TPSS is clearly the most famous one. And now we come to one thing which is a headache point. The next class of functionals are so-called hybrid functionals. the stars of DFT. Everyone wants to use hybrid functions. And uh, sometimes you try to publish something done with GG and the referee might say, you cannot publish this paper because it is not used with a, with a, with a good function. So the hybrid functionals are supposed to be right now the answer to many problems which the other functionals still have. So the, here there is still a little bit of question mark. A lot of development in meta GGAs is really very recent. These here, they exist since a long time. I will tell you in a minute what it is. And uh, they, it works really rather well. So for in many systems, for example, which contain transition methods or very localized um, electrons, where I've told you that we have problems with, uh, with the self-interaction, hybrid functionals cure not all, but a good part of the trouble. So they are very nice and uh, therefore very popular. But I said they are also a reason for headache, and they are a reason for headache in two cases. When I have said that the meta GGAs already are not purist density functionals, because you need the quant sharp orbitals to know what this is, here you will see in a minute you need the, also the quant sharp orbitals, but you need them in a, in a very explicit way, which I will, uh, will be clear in a minute. So this is number one. It is very strongly depending on quant sharp orbitals. And B, it is extremely slow. So the same kind of calculation, if you can do it with a GGA, it is not said that you can also do it with a hybrid, because it, depending on your system, a calculation on the same computer with everything else, exactly going from GGA to a hybrid, is between 10 and 100 times slower. So, I mean, this makes a difference. If with one calculation you can get the result in a week, for example, with the GGA, if you need 100 weeks, I mean, then uh, it's, <laughs> you have to start your calculation, you have to wait until your PhD is over to get the result. No? I mean, so, yeah, I mean, so one has to be careful with it. Often they are now necessary, and they give, as I said, very open, very nice results, and there are many, many different flavors of hybrid functions, but they are heavy to use, and they rely on the orbitals. Now, what are they? What is this? But it's called hybrid. Okay. Hybrid tells you that something is neither one thing nor another thing. It is a mixture between two worlds. And the two worlds which are being mixed in this hybrid is the world of density function theory and the world of Hartree-Fock. So you see, we always come back to Hartree-Fock. So what people here are doing is they say, we write E exchange correlation S in a hybrid. the correlation energy of some form of GGA. For example, it could be the correlation, the approximation to correlation of, say, PPE or so. Okay. But then you add 1 minus alpha, where alpha is a number between 0 and 1. You add 1 minus alpha, the exchange energy of um, of half and you add alpha times the exchange energy, no, sorry, it's exactly the opposite of the GGA, and you add alpha times the change energy of half the fork. So if alpha equals to zero, you simply have a GGA. But now, and if you put alpha equals to one, Okay. Then you have something which looks like Hartree Fock, uh, sorry, yeah, which looks like Hartree Fock because you have done it, except that you add some strange approximation for, um, for correlation, which in fact does not give good results. Now, this looks like something which falls down from, from heaven. Okay, so we have, we all know what Hartree Fock is, but we said this is a wave function, it's something completely different, DFT is something completely different. 
And this is why many people like, I'm sure that Purdue has never done a calculation <laughs> with a hybrid function. We never do something like this. Because a hybrid function, it, it leads, for example, to the fact that if you now derive this energy to minimize the energy, you obtain an exchange correlation potential, like always in DFT, but it will not be local because the hartford fock exchange leads to the non-local potential. So you end up with a DFT which has non-local potentials, which is, which is not really a DFT world. So why is one doing this? One kind of very hand-waving argument could be the following. One could argue, well, we know by experience that if you do a GGA, the band gap is always too small. If you do half your fork, the band gap is always much too large. So if you mix some percentage of the DFT and some percentage of half your fork, then we might get the right band gap. Okay? So one could argue and in fact, in, as a result, it's not so wrong. This is precisely what is happening. You have one theory which gives you a wrong answer in one sense, the other theory the wrong answer in the other sense, and if you mix the two together, then you get something which is better. So this is one way you can see it. But to defend the honor of the people who have suggested these kind of things first, um, one must say there is a very deep scientific reason which I cannot explain here. There is there are some exact theorems for the exchange correlation energy, like those which lead to, to the exact conditions which I've mentioned. And there, one can argue that some conditions are very well satisfied if this number alpha here has a value of one half. Okay, one can argue this. Of course, so, but, okay. So, but all hybrid functions have this form, and it works quite well, but it is very slow. And it is so slow because Evaluating half your fork exchange, I remind you, it is the thing where you have psi i times psi j at one position, psi i times psi j at the other position, divided by r1 minus r2. That, is, that takes a lot of time to evaluate in a computer, this is why it's so slow. Okay? So you lose the speed advantage of DFT, but you get much better results, both much better than half your fork and much better than DFT without this. So this is why hybrid function are. They are right now the star <laughs> in, in, in the DFT world. Question is, what is the value of this alpha? Hmm? So there are many different, uh, like there are many different GGAs. There are also many different hybrid functions, and each hybrid function has different values of this alpha. Okay. Now comes one thing which for you, if you want to use these functions, is very important, and that is how their names are. And unfortunately. The names of hybrid functions, they are very similar to the names of GGAs. Okay? So, for example, one of the most famous ones is called PBE0. Now, PBE0, so if someone tells you I use PBE0, it, it seems like kind of PBE, but the change is enormous because PBE would be just a, a GGA function. With PBE zero, you have half fog exchange, and everything is much more complicated, much more whatever. This, for example, has alpha equals, I think it's 0.25. Point this year, I'm, uh, I beg your pardon, I'm not 100 percent that alpha is this, but anyway, so if you use a code, the code knows. If you put in PBE zero, the code knows what this. <laughs> What the number is. Okay. Another very famous, um, which is probably the most used, is called, it has a name very similar to blip. It's not called blip zero, it's called B3 blip. Okay. So these people, they have the tendency to plug in some number somewhere in the name of the GGA and then it becomes a hybrid function. Um, so I, I mean, it's clearly not a didactical way. If, if some teacher also would have thought of making systematic, no one would have invented names which look like something which is completely different just by some number and then it's PBE zero and sometimes it's a B3. So be careful. I mean, when I was a, a student, these things were already round, used much less because computers were much slower, so one could not use them so much. And I was reading paper, and for me it was like, what do they call PBE, PBE zero? So for me, I had not even understood that this is a completely different kind of approach, PBE zero or B3 lib, that it's completely different from a B lib calculator. Okay? So these little numbers here, they indicate that um, one is in a different world. Okay? 
So you can see now the kind of hierarchy we have written in the following way. If you are an LDA or LSD, you only use local information about the density. If you go one step further, we also go a little bit further between pure locality or in a semi-local world, you also use the gradient, the density. You can go one step further and you also use the local kinetic energy density to write down the function. And this comes better. Or you can go to a step four and you use also the occupied Poincharme orbitals explicitly to write um, this term here. And then there is even a fifth class which is extremely precise, but which takes such a long time that one can equally well do open quantum chemistry calculations. And uh, they use, I think they do not have a name like, let me see if they have, I think they do not really have a name like, no, it's just that they use, not only occupied, they uh, use um, functionals, Unoccupied Poincharme orbitals. Okay. So while in a hybrid functional you write something which depends on all occupied Poincharme orbitals by writing the exchange, then here there are functionals and they are typically extremely, extremely complicated and very hard to evaluate, in terms, but they give super precise results. This is if you also use a number of those orbitals, so eigenfunctions of the Gonchamp Hamilton, which are empty, and then people write very complicated uh, things like this. Okay. So these are kind of is a hierarchy, and as I've said last time, this hierarchy has a name, and this is done with an with an analogy from the Bible which is this famous Jacob's Ladder, which is a ladder which is supposed to go from, from here, from our, from our unfortunate world to paradise. And every time you climb a little bit up the ladder, you come closer to paradise. Okay? So people say there is a ladder, Jacob's Ladder of density function theory. And the first rung, the first step of the ladder is LDA. So the zero rung that people say is Hartree Fock, uh, really in the, in the uncorrelated world. Then you have LDA is the first rung. Then you go one step up in your ladder towards paradise and you arrive at the GGAs. Then you go up one rung further and you arrive at meta GGAs. Then you go one rung up and then you're in the hybrid functions. And every time everything becomes more complicated to evaluate, computers become slower, but the results become more accurate. And if you are able in your system to do something like this, you have really very, very good results. So, um, this is uh, what I wanted to say here. And now I will need the projector which hopefully works today. Let me show you an example of a picture of Jacob's letter. So, also sometimes people use the prescriptions of one or the other, but they vary the value. Ah, so in B3 they've said alpha is 1.15 percent. So, but this value of alpha then sometimes people also change. So, we have done very often in given materials, we do a calculation and then we fit, for example, in PBE0, this parameter until we get what, what we know must be the result, for example, for the band case. Now this is something which is against the principle of having a, a universal function which works for everything. But since we are not in paradise but halfway uh, down on earth, we sometimes adjust this parameter until our results are as nice as we want. So this is the computer. Let's write.
projector seems to be powering up, but the computer is not on. You can also include information about the gradient of the density. You end up with the GGA, and these are PBE or BLEAP, or then there are many other things. The next step is you arrive at meta functionals, okay, which depend also on the local kinetic energy density, which is people call tau, or if you want the second, the derivative of uh, or something which also depends on the local exchange density and this is for this you really need the, the Kohn-Sharm orbitals and you are in the finest hybrid functionals which are typically V3 leaf or PBE0 or something like this and then there are all kind of other more complicated uh, things and then there are also those which depend also on the non occupied orbitals and here you're really very close to to the chemical accuracy heaven where you would like to go okay? So people call this sometimes, it was, and every, so you see, the simplicity, it's what, the lower you are, the more simple the things are to go to able to use, but the accuracy is typically going up, eh, going from, from down to heaven. So people compare this sometimes with a, with a ladder, and this I will now show you. So this is a slide which I found on the internet where people have so okay, so we have this here, so that the computer time is increasing as you go up the ladder from hardware to LDA, GDA, meta, occupied orbit, unoccupied, and, and finally you arrive in heaven. And here you see kind of a, some artist's view of this, so you see here down there's a scientist sleeping, which is typically me or you during my leg. So here is the world, here up is paradise, and you see here the angel, angels going up and down. Eh? And here, so you see here, this is the LDA, GTA, eh? and so on. So this is what people call Jacob's ladder. And this Jacob's ladder is a way how people try to put kind of an order into this word of many hundreds and thousands of available functions which one can use. Okay? So this is one thing I wanted to show you. But then we have lucky time. I can continue with this. Okay, I accept everything you want to accept. Screen, where is it? Okay, so now we come, so I said we, we are getting closer and closer to, to practical applications. And the thing which most people here are using are play -based. So I would like to use show as a space set. And I would now, before on Monday, I show you how in the real code this is done, I would like to give you some impressions about this and what it means. So, the first slides are all stuff which I have explained many times. So we are in a DFT world. We have a density function theory, Hamiltonian, acting on single particle orbitals. They are called Kohn-Sharm orbitals in the DFT world. We solve an eigenvalue equation, which gives us eigenvalues, and we will occupy the n lowest ones. And the DFT Hamiltonian is a kinetic energy, an interaction with the nuclei, which is just the 1 over r, or as I say, a nuclear charge than one of us. It's an easy thing. We will see later in these slides that it's not always so easy. Plus a half chain, which is the classical Coulomb interaction, plus the, uh, the unknown exchange correlation, which is the functional derivative of the exchange correlation energy, which we have been approximating earlier in these lectures. Okay? So since this here, especially this term, this depends on the density, it means that your Hamiltonian depends on the solution. And therefore, we need to do this self-consistent cycle of guessing first the Hamiltonian, then with the result, we obtain a better one, and so on. So we have to find a self-consistent solution to this. And at self-consistency, we have a Kohn-Sharm Hamiltonian and Kohn-Sharm eigenvectors, which are, um, are one consistent with the other. Okay. So 
then to do this in a computer, so this I have already said several times, we write those cone charm orbitals as linear combinations of basis functions. Okay? And the basis function we have said can be anything. Typically it should be easy functions because one has to evaluate things like integrals and so on <coughs> in these basis functions. So the unknowns, once you have chosen a set of this is called NB, the number here of NB different linear independent basis functions. Then the unknowns are these expansion coefficients C. So each of the cold sum orbitals is given by a linear combination which is defined by these numbers here of the basis functions. Okay? And we have also seen, remember perhaps that lesson, how then the H psi, this epsilon psi, becomes a matrix equation which determines, so the unknown the size is given in terms of the unknown expansion coefficients. And here you will have a contram Hamiltonian in form of a matrix. And you have a matrix times a vector is eigenvalue times thing. So this is what the computers really saw in this eigenvalue equation. What is the dimension of H? Oh, well, unfortunately, it's already written here. <laughs> it's number of basis functions times number of basis functions. Okay? Because you have number of basis function unknowns, so this vector here has the size of number of basis functions, because for each basis function you need one expansion coefficient for each one, and this is what the computer is really solving. Well, now, uh, here it is, most people work as basis function with these simple plane waves. Okay? So the simple plane waves are something which is completely independent of the material you have at hand, independent of where the atoms are, it's not atoms and it's nothing, it's simply a function like this and the only unknown is k and the larger k, the smaller the wavelength of these waves. Okay? So this is one possible um, basis that one can use. Another one are localized basis sets like Gaussians or atomic orbitals which will be localized around every position of the atom, which means that if you do dynamics or something and move an atom, then your basis set changes which will have consequences in those cases, okay? So, so on one hand, we would like the form of these basis function to be simple, because we need to go to integrals of them and square moduli, so as, the more simple they are, the better. But we would also like to have not too many of them. And these two things are kind of contradictory. On one hand, if you use atomic kind of functions, then you have already a lot of information in chemistry there, so you probably need less basis functions. Then if you use something which has no information at all about where your atoms are, which are like these, these waves. Okay? So as a very general rule, if you use plane waves or a grid in space, you need many, many, many more basis functions than in the case when you use simply atomic orbitals or Gaussians. Or Each one has its advantages and disadvantages. So if we now talk about plane waves, which is what we are using here in our code, so our code, for example, is called PW, plane wave. <laughs> okay. And uh, so it has many advantages. One is, a, a, if you have e to the i k x, any operator would be simple. You derive it with respect to x, very simple. You derive it with respect to, to k, very simple. You calculate the, the kinetic energy, it's just k squared. So you see, it's, it's really easy to manipulate. Yeah? So coding, in fact, is very easy. One plane wave which has a different wave vector than another one, is always more orthogonal. So by construction, you have a basis set which has no overlaps. This is also very useful for your calculations. Then, as I have said, you move your atomic positions, and the basis set remains the same, because it's not, the, the basis set is not localized where your atoms are. If instead you use Gaussians, which are concentrated on the atoms, then, because you change your basis set when you move an atom, in principle, you change the Hilbert space in which you're doing your calculations, and this has a consequence which is called Poulet forces. So that is a derivative of the energy due to the incompleteness of the basis set and the change of the basis set. So such Poulet forces, they need to be evaluated, but not if you have plane wave, because you do not change the basis set when you have, um, when you have plane waves. Then one of the biggest important things is it's completely unbiased. You do not assume that the contram orbital looked like local atomic um, um, orbitals. You, they can look whatever they want and you describe any shape of the contram orbitals using them. But, I mean, it might be wasteful because we all know that 
the quadrum orbitals and the electron structure will have something to do with what happens around the atoms and so on. So on one hand there is it's unbiased, but this might also be wasteful. Then, in my opinion, one of the biggest advantages of claim waves is that there is a very easy way to control how good your basis set is. And that is, so that we will see in, in some slides later, I will introduce this cut-off parameter. So one will not use all possible wave vectors because that would be infinite, infinite but one chooses a finite set of, of claim waves only. And how many plane waves one uses is determined by a uh, so-called cut-off parameter. The larger this parameter, the better its circulation. So you have one very easy parameter which you can increase, 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 and you observe, for example, your energy. And once it is converged, then you say, OK, now my basis set is good enough. If you have atomic orbitals, you have nothing like this. You have atomic orbitals. They are what they are. And if you wonder, is my basis set good enough? You have in a very complicated way to add more radial functions or more other things. So there is not an easy one number which as it becomes larger, everything becomes more exact. As it becomes lower, it is less exact. So this is a huge, huge, huge advantage that we can very easily control the precision of our basis set by one parameter. So we increase it, increase it, until nothing changes anymore, and then we go, okay, we are good enough. Okay? And the other big advantage is that between R space and K space, there's a very fast way of going back and forward with Fourier transformations. So these are all advantages of play waves. The other advantage is the following. We all know that in the Kronchan Hamiltonian is the Hartley potential, V Hartley. Okay. And how is it calculated? The Hartley potential, well, we have we've seen it many times at the position R, is given by the density divided by the thing. So either you have to really take this integral, which is kind of a tough thing, and it is, if you do it in real space, if you have n points in real space, for each point you have to integrate over all other points, so it's the number of points in space squared, which is really not something very useful. If you use an FFT and you have the Fourier transform of the density, then you can notice that this here, what you have written here, is in fact a convolution. You see? This function which you are looking for at position r is given by another function n at another position convoluted with the, the function 1 over r. Okay? So this is the definition of a convolution. And you might remember from uh, your lessons in mathematics and so on that what is in real space a convolution? is in reciprocal space a multiplication. Okay? So if you now wonder what is the Fourier transform of the Hartley potential, which is written here, then it is simply a product of the Fourier transform of the density times the Fourier transform of 1 over r. The Fourier transform of 1 over r is 1 over g squared, and therefore you have in one shot directly the, the, the sort of the Poisson equation. So this is a huge advantage of using uh, plane waves, is that since you're doing Fourier transform of your orbitals of er everything all the time anyway, you only need to take a Fourier transform of the density, you have n of g, you divide it by g squared, and you have the half of it. Very quick, very useful. So the disadvantages, I've mentioned them. There are many, many of them. So you can easily have 100,000 of plane waves per atom in your system. So the Hamiltonian has a huge, huge, huge dimension. And, uh, but so-called pseudo-potentials, which are the last thing I would like to introduce to the later today, um, help you to reduce the number of uh, plane waves. And uh, so plane waves are really useful only if your system is periodic, so kind of increasing. So if you would like to take a, a molecule, which is not periodic, which is just a molecule, then you have to do some tricks. Typically, the trick is you do a periodic calculation in a very big box. You put in the middle of the box your molecule, and then you know that since the box, which is the periodic, is so large, the copy of your molecule will be so far away that it doesn't interact, and therefore you calculate, in fact, uh, a molecule isolated by taking a periodic molecule very far away. If you would like to calculate a surface, you are also kind of in you are in a mixed situation. You would like a periodicity in this direction and this direction, but in the direction perpendicular to your surface, you do not want periodicity, no? because there is material and then nothing, and both are semi-infinite. 
What one is doing is the so-called slab. So one, is, one always has periodicity in all three dimensions. So one takes uh, a thickness of material, then a thickness of vacuum, and repeats that periodically, like a sandwich. So you have slices of material and always two surfaces. But one is always bound to periodic systems if you are using platelets. So there are many codes which use platelets. Here we use PW in case the mainly. VAST, this VAST and Abinit are the two other main uh, codes which are using platelets, which are VAST. So this here is a free code uh, which one can get for free and use. So is Abinit. VAST is a code where one has to pay a license. Castep, I'm not sure it's uh, developed in Britain. I'm not sure if it's payable or if it's mm -hmm. free. Well, you have to pay. Okay, so Castip is also plain wave code, but you have to pay. CPMD is used very little recently. It was used a lot in the past, and then the authors of CPMD have dedicated themselves to another code. But there are, there are also many other codes which do this. So now I would like to explain you this parameter where we have said which controls the convergence of your basis set. So, I have just said that we always have one computational box. Okay? So imagine that your computational box is, say, a simple cube, like this. And your simple cube, say, has a side length of L. And this is repeated periodically. Okay? Now, you would like to describe only periodic things inside uh, this cube. So all plane waves, so this function f, which will depend on your reciprocal lattice vector g, they will all be e to the i g times r, and you want this to be periodic inside your box. And therefore you know that your g vectors, they must be in each direction, so 2 pi divided by l times an integer n m t. Okay? So, because only if your wavelength is a multiple of 2 pi divided by L, then you have an integer number of, of oscillations inside your box. Okay? So, therefore, um, using plane waves, you will have G vectors, which are discrete, given by these uh, numbers, N, M, and P. So, N, N, P, they are uh, integers. Okay? And this is kind of shown here. So you have 2 pi over L. So if you imagine just a two dimension, you would have um, either, so, so no, but this here thing here is first showing something else. So this here means that you have a periodic system. And each green point is a repetition of your periodic system. Okay? So this means that in G space, you have also something periodic. And here you have these G vectors that we have just mentioned. Then, we know in such a periodic system, this you have learned in your solid state physics class, any wave function has the block form. Okay, so your, uh, your cone sharp orbitals will have a block form, which is something periodic, which we can describe using plane waves, which allow only periodic stuff, times a phase vector e to the i kr, and the k is what is the, the defining vector of this. Okay? So the U's are periodic with respect to a translation to the next unit cell. And this here, the periodic part of it, we write in our basis function e to the i g r, where g satisfies what I've just said. Okay? So the unknowns, as before, are the, the expansion coefficients, the expansion coefficient for each plane wave, and for each function, which is labeled here. Okay. Now, the block orbital itself is e to the i k r times the periodic part. The periodic part, we have just written it. And so, now instead of the e to the i g r, which we have had before here, we now have also the e to the i k r, which we can plug in here. So, you have e to the i k plus g times r. Okay? And this means that you have a vector of plane waves, which is a set of plane waves, which is not centered exactly at zero, but which is moved a little bit. And this, the quantity by which it is moved is precisely the k. So the grid of your g vectors satisfies what I have on the blackboard and would be centered at zero. Due to the block nature of your function, so if it has a block vector k, 
you are a little bit shifted here. But still, so the number of basis function of play waves you have is infinite. Because n, m, and p, these three numbers, so here in two dimension two, this goes here up and down, left and right, from plus infinity to minus infinity. And so in the third direction. So you have an infinite number of play waves, of basis functions, which obviously no computer can handle. So what shall we do, therefore? Well, we can notice that the larger the modulus of g, the smaller becomes the wavelength. But you would like this basis set to describe a physical wave function or physical contram orbital. And we know that the contram orbitals, they do not um, oscillate or have features which are much smaller than the typical size of so we know that they are smooth at a certain level. Okay. Since they are smooth, we do not need to have extremely large G vectors which could describe oscillations on a very, very short scale. So what one is doing is one says, it's enough if you describe features up to a given sm um, smallness, a given wavelength, and therefore the modulus of our basis function of this, of this thing here is enough if you keep it lower than a given uh, um, um, range. Okay? And this is shown here. So what introduces this, what I called before, a cut-off energy, and one chooses only those plane waves where the modulus squared, and then it's multiplied to be like a kinetic energy with h bar over 20, is lower than a given energy. So instead of using an infinite number of plane waves where, this, where all these yellow points are included, one uses only those where the modulus of um, the, the exponent in the plane wave, of the wave vector, the modulus is smaller than the cut. And then, as I said before, you can very, very easily test if this is good enough as an approximation, because you can simply increase the cutoff more and more, therefore you have smaller and smaller wavelengths at your disposal, and at a certain point you will notice the energy will not change anymore, and it will not change anymore because you have wavelength is small enough included such that you have the shape of the wave functions which, which you would like. Okay? So this is the, really the biggest advantage of plane waves, in my opinion, is this, that you have one simple parameter, one number. If this number goes to infinity, you would include all of things. Obviously, then you have a, a, a very large dimension of your Hamiltonian. The smaller you make it, the faster is your calculation, but the more approximate it is. And if you have one parameter, you can control the accuracy of your basis set. This is something which is really very nice. Okay, so I think this is some, some very special here. So when you express the Gonchamp orbitals in terms of plane waves, then you can also obviously express the density, which is the square of the orbitals, also with plane waves. But you will need, and this is something if you want I can explain it to you in private, you will need a different cutoff for the density than for the plane waves. Okay? But, okay, then, then for the orbitals. But this is something which, um, which is kind of a detail with the spec because I want to show you some, something else. So, in all our lessons, kind of one term which has always appeared in half epoch and the DFT and so on, was always the so-called external potential. Okay? We have said it's important because it's the fingerprint of your system, but we have also kind of always said it's very easy because it is simply nuclear uh, minus nuclear charge divided by the distance from. from so it's something very easy. It's a local potential. It is. I, it has never been a trouble. But the truth is, for plain wave people like us, this is trouble, and I will show you why. So, it is not a trouble if you have easy atoms. But now if you go to atoms which are heavy, okay, then you, you have electrons which might be 5s electrons, or 5p electrons, okay, which do your chemical bonding. Let us look at a typical example. Where is it here? This is the case of a silver atom. Okay? And this is just one atom in space. How do the radial wave functions of a silver atom look like? Okay. So we have, all these are occupied, 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, 3d, 4s, so all these things here are 
electrons, which you need to describe somehow if you do electronic structure where silver is included. Okay? So, how do these wave functions look like? So you see, for example, the 1s wave function, the black line, you can probably not even see it from where you are, because it is uh, here uh, one peak which is very close to the nucleus, it goes into zero again, and then you do see no sign anymore. So this is something which is extremely localized in space, the 1s wave function. But, if you want to describe something which is so close uh, in Earth, you will need, uh, if you describe it in flame waves, a very, very, very high g vector, because you need a very small wavelength to describe something which is so localized. No? So if you really would like to do with flame wave basis at a silver atom, you would need to be able to describe this kind of shape of the silver 1s electron, and therefore you would need an incredibly high cutoff such that probably the calculation would be undoable on a normal computer. However, we go further up and look, for example, here, this is the 5S wave function. The 5S wave function, in contrast to the 1S, is extended over a very much, la uh, a much larger range, and you see also it is very smooth outside there. And now we come to the most important concept, which is that some electrons are different from others. In in an atom or in a molecule. Why are they? Well, you see, the silver atom, we are not so much interested in what the silver atom does by itself. We are interested in how the silver atom interacts with other atoms which are close by. Does it make a chemical bond? Does it not make a chemical bond? Will it, will it bind? What is the binding? These are the questions we have. Those electrons which are responsible for the interaction of our silver atoms with other atoms, they are those wave functions you see here, which are in the range of, of 1 to 3 Armstrong non-zero. The 1s wave function, it will never intervene in any bonding with other atoms. So this is why one separates electrons into so-called core electrons, which are very close to the nucleus, and they do not care what is happening around our atom. They, they, they are looking only at themselves and not at their neighbors. Okay? While the valence electrons, like these, all these here are valence electrons. They care about the, the neighbors of our atom, and they will do the chemistry of the bond. So for us, the interesting ones are the valence electrons, but on the core electrons. And now you see, the nice thing is the valence electrons, they are all very smooth. So they can be very nicely described through the plane waves. Not so the 1s and the, the core electrons, which are very localized. And so the idea is the following. We try to do something such that we do not need to describe the core electrons. So this one is that we would like not to describe it. It's anyway just sitting there close to the nucleus and not doing anything. Therefore, we would like not to describe it in our electronic structure description. Now we can say, OK, if it's in some miraculous way, we are able to get rid of the core electrons and describe only, for example, the valence. Let's look, for example, at the 5s electron here. OK. They are very disimportant. This wave function is smooth, so we can use plane waves. But coming close to the nucleus, you see what it is doing? It is oscillating and very fast. Why is the 5s wave function oscillating so fast when it comes close to the nucleus? Any idea? You see the 5s here, it is all these tuck, 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 and all the others have it. Why? Because it doesn't come. It's probability of being near to the nucleus is not. Yeah, it's probably, you're right that the 5s has a zero probability to be close to the nucleus, but this is not the reason why it's oscillating. I mean, it could just go like this to zero, and it also has a zero probability. No, the reason is that the radial part of a 5s wave function must be orthotagonal to the radial part of, for example, the 1s and the 2s. And 3s and the 4s. No? They all must be orthogonal. And since the 1s is, has no middles but is just here localized, if another function has to be orthogonal to it, it has to have the same riddle but in the opposite form. So the 1s wave function always, as you've seen in the hydrogen atom, has a shape like this, no node. But then the 2s wave function will need to have one node. The three S will have to have two nodes and so on. This is because they are all S wave functions, the angular part is the same, 
and therefore the radial part must become orthogonal, and therefore they must have these oscillations. So also the wave functions we are interested in will have close to the nucleus riddles, which we cannot describe with plane waves easily. Therefore we would like to have two things. We would like to describe only the valence electrons, not the core electrons, and we would like to have the valence electrons correctly where they are doing something interesting, but we do not like the, all the other beetles they have, just the nucleus, which are also unimportant for interaction with the okay. And in order to obtain these two goals, no core electrons, only valence electrons as solutions, and no fast oscillations close to the nucleus, one is replacing, in calculations, the external potential, which was minus C divided by R minus the potential. So this is the normal Coulomb potential. But it's replacing this with something which is called a pseudo potential. Okay? So I had hoped today to explain to you how a pseudo potential works. Unfortunately, time is over. So I will on Monday first talk about pseudo potentials. And uh, so there is, pseudo-potential, in fact, is a trick how one can replace how the nucleus interacts with the electron, which allows us to get rid of the 1s, the 2s, and all those wave functions which are irrelevant for us, and which takes away the windows close to the nucleus. And then, thanks to pseudo-potentials, we can use plane waves with a rather low cutoff, and everything becomes easy to use. Okay. So on Monday I will do that and explain to you.